Welcome. You are listening to The Mindful Minute, meditations created for everyday joy. I'm your host, Meryl Arnett, and my passion is making meditation accessible and enjoyable. This podcast is recorded from my live Monday night meditation class, where we have a brief discussion followed by a guided meditation. If you would like to access these meditation practices as standalone audio files for your daily practice, please subscribe to my newsletter at merylarnett.com. It's free and you'll receive a new mini meditation each week, along with behind the scenes content and bonus material for each podcast episode. All right, let's grab a cup of tea, a comfy seat, and settle in for today's practice. Hello, friends. I am so glad to be here with you today. And today I am bringing a conversation with home cook, cookbook author, and quite frankly, your cooking cheerleader, Deborah Johnson. And I'm guessing a whole bunch of you right now are wondering why on earth I am interviewing a cookbook author on a meditation podcast. It's a great question. And I have what I think is a great answer. You know, as you have likely heard me say already this year, one of my personal goals in 2024 is to really start to honor the broader lens of what it means to feel well in our days. Because the truth is, while I love meditating and I will always be a meditation teacher, That is just one piece of the practices that support me in my days. And I want to start to name, to bring forward some of the other elements that make up what I view as my well-being. I tend to call these other elements, these practices, homesteading the heart practices. And what I mean by that is they are things done at home with what we already have in the moments that we have to do them. So these are not practices that ask you to go buy things. These are not practices that ask you to go on retreat or to dedicate huge chunks of time or to be different in any way, shape, or form. These are small things and big things that support us in being us in our days, however they may look. And, you know, one of my teachers not that long ago made a comment to me that really stuck with me. And what she said was just a reminder that every culture across time Across space, every culture eats and sings and dances. And when I think about that, I, I want to add two more to that because I believe that we eat, that we sing, that we dance, that we have creative expression in some way, we make art in some way. And we tell stories about the stars. We tell stories about the world around us. And those elements are the elements that I invite us to pay attention to along with our meditation practice. And my goal in 2024 is to bring those forward a bit more on the podcast. There will always be meditations on this podcast. And I want there to be just some reminders of the other things. Because I know, you know, I hear from so many people, God, I'm meditating. I am, I'm doing my practice and I'm still stressed. I'm still struggling. And I think naming and honoring these homesteading practices are a way to for the, further support ourselves. And so we're going to talk to Deborah today. We're going to talk about cooking, 
about bringing our mindfulness practice into the kitchen, whether we love to cook, whether we struggle with cooking, whether we are a joyful eater, or maybe we have anxiety around eating, whatever it may be, I hope this conversation sparks some thoughts, some curiosity, and maybe some joy when it comes to stepping into your kitchen. So without any further ado, let's jump into today's conversation. Deborah, welcome to the Mindful Minute. I am so glad to chat with you today. Oh, it's such a privilege to be here. Thanks for thanks for having me. Yeah, I'm happy to connect. And so I want to start with a story, which is very silly, but, you know, I receive dozens of emails every week from either authors or publicists looking to maybe be on the podcast. And most of them, as you can imagine, are people that are writing about mindfulness or meditation. And never once in eight years has anybody ever emailed me and said, I wrote a cookbook. And I'm I'm probably going to regret saying this because now I'm going to get a bunch. But I love cookbooks. I love cookbooks. I collect them. I probably have over 100 cookbooks sitting in my living room right now. And I'm super picky about the cookbooks that I love. Like I, I want it to be textured and have tons of photographs. And I read them like novels from cover to cover. So I want there to be like little stories or anecdotes in them. And your cookbook like checks every box on my list. I was so happy to receive this. I'm so happy to talk to you today. So you have this beautiful new cookbook on rising recipes for recipes and rituals for joyful mornings. And y'all, um, if you're listening and not watching this on YouTube, click over to YouTube so that you can see what I'm holding up because the book is like, it's hefty. This is all textured. There's gorgeous detail everywhere. And then there's like just endless little surprises. <laughs> made me so, so happy. So congratulations on your cookbook. It's stunning. Thank you. Thank you, Meryl. That means a lot. Um, and I hope that once you got the cookbook, you understood the link because totally. It's, yeah. It's it's I really wanted it to be more than a cookbook and just a celebration of life and presents and mornings and all the eating, all those fun things. So and it <laughs> it absolutely conveys that. So it's not just recipes. There are <laughs> reflections and prompts. There are little practices. There's so much woven into it about presence in the kitchen. And I, you know, because when I got it, I was like, oh, I really want to do this because I love cookbooks. But does it fit for listeners who are expecting a meditation? And I really think the answer is yeah. I really think it does. And I'm really excited to talk about all the ways that presence plays into the kitchen, into cooking in our mornings. Um, Maybe you could start just by telling us a little bit about who you are and where you are. And um, yeah, let's start there. Okay. Well, my name is Deborah Johnson and I um, I am on a farm in Texas where I live. And um, I grew up in a very busy, happy home and I love food. So I was mainly unsupervised. And I taught myself to cut (laughs) what I wanted to eat and what I thought the people around me would enjoy, the endless stream of visitors in my house had, um, through cookbooks. So I also share with you uh, just a love of cookbooks. And I read them. It's it's what I read for fun. You know, Mm. I read them like a novel, (laughs) like you said. Um, And I want to get to know the person and, you know, all Mm. their experiences and how those recipes tell story and all of that. So I had this childhood dream of writing a cookbook. I was working in marketing and just had a very nice corporate job that I loved. But I, um, things lined up in my life where after a very hard and arduous season where I didn't have room for, you know, dreams or goals, <laughs> it was mm-hmm. just survival mode. This dream was just bubbling up to the point that I I knew I had to address it or regret it the rest of my life. So I took the leap and I wrote this book. And it's my first 
pick and I poured my heart and soul into it and I just hoped that it would be um something that would be a gift to to others and yeah it just came out and you self-published yeah I did that's amazing yeah really cool boy what a journey <laughs> That's a whole I, well, other conversation. I would love to have that conversation <laughs> offline. I think that's really yeah. fascinating and awesome. That's really cool. Um, so I am curious, as we just mentioned, like there's so much presence woven into this book. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that shows up in, well, I'll set it up a little bit, right? You talk a lot about becoming a morning person, which was not who you were. At, at least at one point in your life, mm-hmm. right? So you mm-hmm. talk a lot about what it means to become a morning person, how you created this habit for yourself and why. And there's much presence and connection in that. And I'm really curious if you have what you might call any type of contemplative practice, whether that's walking in nature or meditating or journaling or what it is you do to cultivate that sense of mindfulness in yourself. Yeah, well, for me, and and I I talk about this a little bit in, in the book, but that my my actual practice for the past decade of my life is I wake up and I make myself some coffee and I sit and talk to God first thing every day, and then I find definitely that time in nature, we've you know got this little farm. And just walking around and just spending time soaking it in. I loved your your podcast on recently. Mm. Just there's, I think that's been the most shocking and wonderful thing about moving to the country or, you know, from, from land. It's just, I have never spent so much time just like <laughs> looking at a, a little dew drop. I mean, the, the and mm. the pace in a city is such that I know, I know there's dew drops in the city. I know there's clouds, <laughs> but I've never noticed them. And so I really try to make a point of spending time <clears throat> without my phone, just walking around outside and just noticing, <laughs> being mm-hmm. being present. And that's that's a prompt I give in the book. And something I'm challenging myself with, especially this year, is how do I measure my days? You know, and if I'm being very honest like one, I've measured them by my productivity and my output. And I don't want to do that anymore. Mm. And I I really feel a call to measure measure my days by how present I really am for them. How alive I am in that day. And <clears throat> I'm not alive <laughs> when I'm looking at my phone, you know? Mm-hmm. An hour can pass and I'm like, wait, wait. What's that? I'm not present when I'm just um, checking things off my to-do list. And so how can I more lean into um, the, the aliveness, the, the moments to treasure and celebrate and, and really be there for the day? Mm-hmm. You know, I recently, um, the last half of 2023, so all of part of October, all of November, all of December, I took a, a mini hiatus and I, I wasn't teaching live classes um, aside from the handful that I had already committed to. And I biggest thing was I wasn't posting on social media. And I don't think of myself as somebody who spends a lot, like I'm not a huge social media person. I use literally one platform. I'm on Instagram. Otherwise you will not find me. Like I, I don't, I didn't feel like I was doing a ton. And the number of times I caught myself picking up my phone just to check, I was floored. I was floored by yeah. how many times a day I reached for that phone only to be like, oh my God, the app's not there right now. Here I am again. So that invitation I love, even if you're not getting off of social media, but taking that 20 minutes, 30 minutes, hour in your day to say, the phone is not with me right now. Whoa, does it change things? Boy, and it, it's a vacation. I, I started losing my phone on purpose because if I can find it, I will reach for it. Like you said, it's a situation. Yeah. Um, 
but if I can't find it, that day turns into a vacation, which is amazing, you know, because <laughs> all of a sudden you're like, wow, so much space has opened up, even in my being. I've, I found that I'm much more inclined to like, hmm, maybe I do have time, just 10 minutes to paint a little bit. Or, you know, the, the creative side of your brain um, or just those little projects that you want to get to, but you never have time for. Mm-hmm. You suddenly have a little bit more time when um, your phone isn't a part of the equation. And again, I'm not, we need our phones. I'm not like on a soapbox about phones. I, I actually, I don't care. But what I care more about is how, how can we find ways in the pace of modern life with the demands we all have professionally and, you know, humanly to enjoy what is and reconnect with that. Yeah. You write a lot about sort of reimagining the kitchen as a place of presence and joy. And I know, you know, I find that for myself. I love to cook. It is the place I go when I like want to feel good. Mm -hmm. And I noticed that you and I both come from large families. I'm also a child of four. Um, I saw that. (laughs) And I'm the oldest, though, not the youngest. I'm the oh, oldest. So I'm a total I'm bossy control freak. Um, you have all the responsibility. <laughs> totally. <laughs> um, and I also came from a family where we had to sit at the table. We sat at the table. We had a conversation. I mean, obviously, there were not screens like there are today, but we weren't allowed to watch TV while we ate. It was like it was a very conscious act. And and before I go any further, let me just make a huge disclaimer because now I'm a parent and I realize how ungodly hard that is to do as a parent after working all day and you're so tired and I'm not here to shame anybody. I do my best, but we definitely have nights where we watch TV during dinner because I just can't have a conversation. So there's the disclaimer. There's no guilt if you are not having family dinner every single night. However... I am curious about if you find that maybe that steered you towards that path of presence or joy in the kitchen in in any particular way. Oh, absolutely. Because I think eating is something we all have to do every day to survive. But unlike other aspects of our, you know, kind of the basic pyramid of needs, it's such an innately joyful thing, you know? There's, in a multi-sensory engaging thing, there's, um, it's delicious that you're, you're engaging your senses, you're nourishing your body, but also it's a connection point, right? I think we all experience that food. When you, when you break bread with someone, it's just different. It's mm-hmm. a different conversation. When you gather around and, especially if you cook for someone. Wow, what a beautiful way of showing love. It could be disgusting. Like it doesn't have to be anything great. I've I've had unfortunate meal. <laughs> that Me too. <laughs> you know, don't turn out. And it doesn't it doesn't matter. It's the act of sitting at a table with someone and showing them. I I I honor you. I want to eat with you. I want to celebrate life with mm. you. And I think, of course, you know, family, family dinners, e- even now, if you were to ask me my happiest memories, my happy place, it's family dinner. <laughs> with, um, with, it's, it's just sitting around um, the table and having those long meals with laughter and you're sitting around for hours after. And I think as an adult, it's really helped me lean into that is traveling. <laughs> Because unfortunately, I think in America, we've come to a place where eating is just something to check off the to-do list. How fast can you do it? Um, On to the next. And in Europe, I mean, if you're going to sit down for a meal, you're going to be there for a few hours. And we've spent a good amount of time in France and you're going to have a whole bottle of wine. That's gonna happen. <laughs> You're gonna, um, you know, they don't even make multiple reservations in a night because they know that that table is yours for the whole night. Wow. And it's such a joyous way. You're, you're toasting, you're enjoying, you're savoring. And I love 
I love that. And what I want that to become more of our culture. How can we, um, because frankly, in, we were living in downtown Dallas and none of my friends enjoyed cooking. And it was just how fast can we get through this eating chore? And I was just feeling like, boy, there's such a missed opportunity here Mm -hmm. for this. This, it is a, it is a chore. It's something we have to do, but it could be such a highlight of any day and a highlight of our life if we could reimagine the kitchen. You know, I was just having this memory, um, which is, it's funny because it's almost the opposite of what you're saying, but it makes the exact same point. So my favorite memory of family dinner as a kid is there was a period of time I was like probably maybe 10-ish, right? And my dad had gone back to school to get a master's degree. So he was going to school at night, which meant like one night a week, I think. My mom was home with all four little kids. Remember, I'm the oldest. So it was like stair steps down, 10 down. And that night, that one night a week, we ate the exact same thing every night, which was frozen fish sticks and frozen french fries. And we sat in front of the TV and we watched Saved by the Bell. So it was the opposite. It was the opposite of what our normal dinner was, which is like we're at the table. There's no TV. Nobody can leave until everybody's done. There was like sort of rules or pressure around dinner. You had, and we had to clean our plates. Um, right. And so that one night was like this super fun. Dad wasn't home. It was like a secret thing that we did. We got fish sticks. <laughs> but this, and so the the point of that is it was not fancy right it's absolutely like this joyous it felt like a party it felt yes. like a celebration on a tuesday night yeah and i'm sure it wasn't for my mom like i if she i wish she was here so i could be like hey mom what do you remember about this because i bet she's <laughs> like i was exhausted you know i can only imagine. right but it's such a valuable memory for me now. Mm-hmm. And, and I love what you're asking us to reflect on is like, how do we make Tuesday night, night a celebration? Right. Yeah. How do we do it? And I love that you, you make it so simple uh, and you remind us that it can be so simple. For me, <laughs> we didn't have dessert growing up. So we eat dessert every day. <laughs> Being honest, multiple times a day. <laughs> because to me that that signifies that same thing this is a celebration we get to we get today we get to mm. enjoy a cake or cookies today but even if it's just like popping some you know popcorn on the stove top or it can be so simple but whatever little ritual it is for you as a way of giving yourself permission that today even this Tuesday <laughs> is worthy of celebrating and how can we make it special and fun, even if it's not fancy. So I have some thoughts on what makes cooking sort of joyful and celebratory for me. And I'm really curious if something comes to mind for you, like this is what makes me look forward to stepping into the kitchen to cook breakfast or dinner or whatever Mm. okay i have two answers to that Mm, yeah one is i cook what i want to eat which which i think is very underrated oh (laughs) yes love that I, i think we often can be so external focused that it's like okay well what will so and so eat what will so and so you know like or what what's the healthiest best thing I can make, um, but with cooking you get a lot better at it as you go first of all, <laughs> and so that means you need to do it repeatedly, and those are that's what I see people not doing is trying it once having a mistake and saying oh, I'm a bad cook, but that's not true. <laughs> that's that's the nature of any skill is you, you improve as you go along. And I think you're much more likely to stick to the habit of cooking if you're making what you want to eat. So my biggest encouragement is if you have something that you want, do not go order it on DoorDash. Make it. 
Mm-hmm. And that's such a fulfilling activity. Make it repeatedly. You have a signature dish. And the better you get at that one thing, you're, you're going to get better at anything else you try. So um, for me, cooking is joyous because at the end, I get to celebrate by eating what I would like. So I don't even like going out anymore because you can cook anything, you know, at home. Mm-hmm. And with that little extra ingredient of love that makes it so much more special when you're eating it. But my second answer is cooking is a very mindful and present experience for me. When I take that approach, of I'm going to engage all of my senses and I'm going to give myself the time and permission to be fully here. And as I, you know, cut those herbs, I'm going to smell them. If I'm going to get produce, I want to get the, like, what calls to me, what's engaging to me, you know, those tomatoes with all the different colors, you know, it might be a dollar more, but then I can save, save money elsewhere. But I want those big juicy tomatoes, you know, or just some fun produce. When I need the dough, I don't want to use the KitchenAid. I want to sit there and use that 10 minutes to like, Really have the meeting of the dough become my meditative practice and just be there. It's, you know, meeting dough can be therapy. It really can be. Mm. Um, so though, uh, I think engaging all of my senses as I cook really helps me enjoy uh, cooking as a present mindful activity. Mm, I love that. What about you? I, you know, there are two things that I really, really love. And the first of which is this year, I mean, we do a little bit of gardening. We just live in the suburbs, so we don't have a farm. Um, we have two raised beds and we get like a handful of stuff out of it. But we subscribe to a CSA, Community Supported Agriculture Program. And so this particular program, they actually gather produce from lots of our local farmers. And we get a box every week that is, and I get the biggest box they offer. I'm like, give me everything that is available. And I love receiving that box. It arrives on Thursdays and th- I'm like waiting all day on Thursday. I can't wait for this box to come. I open it up. I pa- like go through everything. I clean it. I put it away, the, you know, and then I have this whole ritual of I make a list of everything I got and I figure out how the heck I'm going to use all of it. And like right now I have black Spanish radishes in my fridge, which I never heard of. I have never eaten. And I'm kind of fun, though. I know how it's <laughs> fun, right? So it's been really, really joyful because it. I'm not in the like, tonight we have spaghetti, tomorrow we have tacos. It's the same thing every week. And I love having the like challenge and excitement of what am I going to do with this crazy thing that I've never cooked before? It's that's very fun for me. I love that. And the other thing that I have really been paying attention to in the last handful of years is what I call ancestral recipes, which is cooking food either that I remember my grandmother cooking or cooking food that comes from my people, right? I'm, my background is Eastern European. So like food that they would have cooked long ago. Like I love exploring that. And we, In our house, all the time we eat dinner and we call it ancestor dinner. We're like, this is ancestor dinner and here's who cooked it or where it came from. I love Uh, that. And it's lovely. It's lovely. It just makes eating so much more than shovel this food in and get on to the next thing. Yes, I love that. And building on that, before I wrote this book, I would have never guessed, I would have no way of knowing how healing it is and empowering it is to just tell you a story. Mm-hmm. I wouldn't even have said I had a story, <laughs> you know, but in forcing myself to write, um, boy, it was just such a healing process. I would encourage everyone to do that. Um, but as I got farther along in the process of, you know, developing the recipes through the books, a lot of them were to tell those stories of this, you know, this is special to me because this is what I grew up on because my mom made it because I have this memory of discovering this on a trip, you know, whatever it is. And I recently did a brunch 
pop up where I created each dish to tell a story about my life. So each part of it represented a part of that story, a character. And I, you know, told the story as I presented each dish. And boy, that was a healing and joyous and fun experience. So I think fun way, if you're looking for ways to learn, to engage with cooking or enjoy it more, tell a story, Mm. even even a hard or painful one. But, you know, think about dishes as a way of telling your stories. And that's a lot of fun. I love that. And I, you know, I want to point out that the stories you tell in the book, they're not all cooking. It's not like they're all stories about food. They're stories about your life that are not taking place in the kitchen. They're, some of them, of course, are taking place around the table, but not all of them. They're stories about your experiences. Mm-hmm. And I think that that's so important to reflect on the way all of these moments sort of weave together. And perhaps, and this might not be true for everybody, but perhaps when we sit down and when we eat and when we're sharing a conversation across the table, those are the moments when those stories, so the threads sort of connect, right? You make connections, I wonder. Yeah. Wow. Yes. And I think that brings up a really beautiful point that the power of gathering around food and around a table is also in the gift of listening to Mm. each other. It's an avenue to listen and to hear each other, truly hear each other, Mm. to take the time to give each other that gift of being there and receiving your story who you are, what you're going through, what you're feeling. And I think we all need a little more of that. Yes. I. This is going to seem random, but you made me think of my very favorite line and one of my very favorite songs, So Old. So this is Bonnie Raitt, and the song is Angels from Montgomery or in Montgomery. And in that song, there's one particular line that she sings, and it says something along the lines of, how the hell does a person work all day and come home in the evening and have nothing to say? And I love that line so much because I have found in my own life, it is really easy to come home and be exhausted and like not engage Mm -hmm. to turn on the TV or open the book Mm -hmm. or sit in the corner. And I think sometimes we just have, like sometimes we're just empty and we need to refill. Yes. And also, when we sit around the table, like we in our house, we always do like, what was the best thing that happened today or the most beautiful thing you saw today? You know, we, we ask questions to sort of prompt the conversation. And always something is said that would not have been said otherwise. And yeah. that opportunity to listen is and we're tired. We're mm-hmm. tired and we're talked at all day long. And so at some point you're like, Lord, for self-protection, I just have to stop listening. But now we have to remember that some moments are moments of I'm stepping out of that place. Nobody is hopefully screaming at me or telling me what to buy or what to shop, you know, how to look. This is my moment to reconnect. Yes. And giving each other that opportunity is so, so powerful. Mm. I, I, my, my husband is a physician and he you know, he's working in the hospital all day and he comes home and almost every day he's just like, oh, these, these patients just need someone to listen to them. Mm. That's it. How many of us go through our days with all these experiences and hardships and just stuff them deeper, deeper, deeper down until physically you break, mentally you break. And, and, and on every level we break, but how, how, what if we supported each other and listened to each other? all along the way you know obviously by the time they're in the hospital there's more that needs to be done than than simply listening but even in a hospital many times you don't have a doc you don't have someone who will just listen and if you ask them just the questions and give them the space to talk and to process that in itself is so healing Mm. what if we offer that to each other before we have to go to the hospital you know Mm. So why don't we, let's set the table for people, okay? So when this comes out, it's going to be the beginning of March, which could be frigid cold as it is today. It could be warming up. Mm -hmm. There might be daffodils out. I don't know. We'll see. We'll see what happens. Um, 
what are we going to cook for breakfast to start our day? Like, how are we supporting ourselves in this transition? What are you, what comes to mind for you? I think cooking seasonally is such a fun way to engage with the season and to listen to the rhythms and what nature is telling us, how to tune into our bodies and what's going on around us. For me, spring, I get so excited about the spring produce. Oh, the little, <laughs> little tender English peas. Oh my gosh. Now that we have a garden, our peas, like, I've never had so much ecstasy induced by a little, <laughs> my husband and I would just sit and eat each one and be like, oh, what? It's so <laughs> um, but, you know, in the book, there's a spring for phyllo quiche and it avoids the annoyance of having to make pie dough. Because all you have to do is make, you know, put in the, the phyllo, which just ruffles so beautifully to make kind of a little masterpiece. And inside is some fresh peas and asparagus i get very excited about the asparagus um uh, encased in just like you know velvety eggs or some goat cheese um that that comes to mind if it's especially if it's a weekend if you're looking to to celebrate um i think if it's still cold for me i find my energy is not at its best <laughs> Mm. you know when when it's feeling very wintry and i just want something really warm and nourishing so a warm chia pudding where you just get that delicious chia with maybe some oat milk over the stove add some vanilla add some nice fresh fruit and you have something very warm and nourishing but fast without having to make a whole a whole shebang (laughs) or a nice or a nice baked oatmeal is what I kind of crave this time of year where again you get a lot of bang for your buck in terms of low effort but something delicious that tastes like cake but it's actually healthy (laughs) Mm, I love that I love that those are what come to mind for me and I actually have a longer list because you know I love food but what what comes to mind for you? <laughs> well chia pudding actually was on the top of my list and as I was flipping through the cookbook this morning over my breakfast I was like oh I need to mate like it's it's about to be right that I'm going to want to eat this so that absolutely was on my list. One of my favorites from your cookbook which really was almost just like a zhuzh up from something we were already doing is your treasure toast. It's like if I was going to pick any breakfast in the world for me, it would be bread and eggs. Like hands down for the rest of my life, I will eat bread and eggs for breakfast. And so we often make what we call toad in the hole, which is a piece of bread. You cut out the middle, you crack the egg into the bread and you do it in a pan and the egg is runny. So good. So good. And you have sort of that. Mm -hmm. But then you add this whole other element that we had not been doing and now we do, which is like. Let's put avocado on top. And then what produce is here for you to use? And as I'm thinking about this, like, as I said, we have radishes right now, like, and we just got green garlic in the CSA bot. So like some of the spring stuff is starting to sneak its way in amidst all the greens that I'm so ready to take a break from. And so like that, those are the things I'm like, oh, I could just takes two seconds, chop up a radish, sprinkle it on top. Right. And you just sort of elevated your breakfast into something lovely and a little bit more complex than just simply eggs and toast. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. One of my favorite recipes in the book. I love the treasure toast. Oh, that makes me so happy. And speaking of eggs, because I am with you, love eggs and bread is so good. My go-to. But I kind of like to do something where I make it once and then I know I have breakfast for the week. Oh, I like this. And so I love the green eggs and ham, which just translating is pretty much a frittata. I think for this time of year, great opportunity to use whatever produce that you find and add it in there. But this one, it's kind of, you know, ham, potato, frittata. You can add a lot of really nourishing feeling things on there. But just that drizzle of that green sauce on top. Wow. Takes it to the next level. And for me, I put it on everything. Anything I'm cooking that week will have some green sauce on it. You know, whether it's chicken, steak, 
you know, salad, anything. Um, but the great thing is you just made that one for God. I had a recent, someone who bought the cookbook who froze it and they said it froze well. Oh, interesting. I was shocked. I, I have not told it. I, I have not tried it. So I can't, you know, verify, but even just having something that you can just slice off, warm it up throughout the week. I find that very comforting and nice because you get a fancy breakfast for multiple days without, you know, just one day of effort. <laughs> I love that. And you and your recipes are sort of divided up. I don't remember the exact titles, but it's like your weekday morning, you know, like mm-hmm. normal yes. morning when we're not doing and then like celebratory mornings, weekend, you know, you have like, yeah, sort of divided up in a way that gives us opportunity to cook based at where we are. Right. Yeah. Some days you just want something healthy and quick. Some days you really just want to go for it and do something to eat. <laughs> yeah, I love that. Um, I feel like I should throw in here <laughs> for the people listening that maybe have partners or roommates that aren't like, not everybody's a huge food lover, right? I So I have two kids, one of whom totally abhors food. Like literally, if he could find a way to not eat, he would absolutely give up eating. He hates all the food. It does not matter what it is. This child hates it, which is so challenging for me because I that food is my love language. And I'm like, I am trying to tell you how much I love you. And you are literally throwing it on the floor and telling me how much you hate it, which is super challenging. Yeah. And. I sort of keep doing it. You know, like I, I. absolutely make him things that he will eat because he will not eat a lot of stuff. My other child eats everything, which is awesome. Um, But I keep putting it in front of him. And I keep just saying, like, this is me cooking the thing that makes me so happy and says to you, I love you and I want you to eat something nourishing. And you don't have to eat it. But also, please don't, like, spit in my face about it. You could just say thank you. (laughs) And so I just didn't name that for listeners because I think it it does add a whole other element of challenge when you're like, Mm -hmm. my kid will only eat chicken nuggets or my partner is like meat and potatoes and does not want a vegetable no matter what. Like that does add an element of challenge. And I don't think that we should let it rob us of the joy of cooking and cooking stuff that we like, right? Like I love that you said you cook stuff you want to eat. I love that. Me too. <laughs> I think that's that's a really good point because yeah, that's uh, hard. And I'd also say if you are a partner who wants more home cooked or someone who wants more home cooked meals, the best way to support each other in that is it's really hard when you prepare something with love and it's spit in your face with your chakra for an adult. There's adult ways to do essentially the same thing. Mm -hmm. And I think it's so important if someone prepares a meal for you to, it doesn't, again, even if it's not perfect to just celebrate that and be so grateful for that. Because I unfortunately hear a lot of my friends that are like, oh, I made your tortillas, but you know, so-and-so just made fun of me because they were shaped wrong. And I'm like, well, you're never going to make tortillas again if that happens, you know? How yeah. do we support each other in those efforts um, so that we can experience eating at home more? It, there's there's just so many things that are healthy about learning to eat and cook for yourself. And you share a little recipe somewhere sort of in the middle of the book, I think, an equation. And it's like paying attention to the thing. We're going to use food as the example, but this could be for anything. Paying attention, like really noticing plus experiencing gratitude mm. equals, I think, grateful savoring, I think, is what you uh-huh. use. And I, I think maybe that's what we're talking about, right, is yeah. whether we're the one cooking, whether the, we're the one receiving the food cooked and we're eating, whether it's our favorite dish or not, like meditators, a huge part of our practice is non-judgment, right? So yeah. like, you know, I love salmon. My partner hates salmon. And sometimes I cook salmon because I love it and I want to eat the salmon. And I I will name like he's really good about 
eating as much of it as he can deal with for the night and not complaining or making any weird faces. And I think a piece of it is like, can I appreciate what's in front of me? So what do I notice? Do I notice the color? Do I notice the texture? Or maybe I think about like where it came from and Mm -hmm. I appreciate Mm that. Mm -hmm. And I experience that sense of gratitude. Like, oh, my partner was tired and cooked this dinner anyways. Yes. This person fished for this fish that I'm going to eat. Somebody went out in the water and got it. Right. Wow. And then that's right. We get to savor that. And I think that's a really good point. And a sad and interesting thing about our water life mm-hmm. is we are so disconnected from the reality of our food chain. And, um, you know, we've only lived here on a farm for a year and a half. So not long. And I am so shocked. I, I, you know, you can tell from the book, I really put a lot of effort into being a, what I'd consider mindful eater. But I had no idea. You have no idea. Because I think this is the first time in history where we're so detached and not involved with our food. And now we're nurturing these little lambs. Oh. And oh my gosh. I mean, it just changes the game. <laughs> Seeing our, you know, the little chickens that we care for and have held since they were babies an egg takes on so much meaning you know mm. like i was saying with the peas every little thing that grows you're like this is a miracle <laughs> and i am sad that we don't even you know when we eat salmon we, we think about sure. the fishermen we don't have to because everything comes perfectly packaged in the store exactly when we want it and we expect it to be there but we do not feel what goes into our food um because we're not involved in it and that's a huge loss agreed anything we can do i think to bridge that gap is healing and important oh i i so agree with you even as it is just taking a minute to think like i wonder where this came from you might not even know the answer right sometimes we don't know Mm-hmm. And I I love and I'm talking so much about it. So listeners, if you live in Georgia, I'm linking to the CSA we use because maybe you want to use it, too. And if you're not in Georgia, I bet there is one in every place that you can find. Um, but in our CSA, they like give us a little piece of paper every week that just has like one of the farmers or a tidbit about a piece of the produce. And, you know, last week we were having that crazy cold snap that really hit most of the country. and. They sent out a note and they were like, just take a minute to send some good wishes to the farmers because it is really cold and they're out there trying to keep everything alive for you to eat, you know, and like, that's not the life I live. So I might not have thought of that, except somebody said, hey, take two minutes today and just like send a well wish to the farmers. I can do that. Mm -hmm. And then when I get that box of produce on Thursday, I'm like, man, somebody was out in, you know, this is Georgia, so it was not that cold, but it was like 14 degrees, which is very cold for us. Very cold. Very cold for you in Texas, I'm sure. Yes. Somebody was out there picking carrots so that we could have carrots. Wow. Yeah. That's huge. It's huge. I love that. And while we're talking about CSAs and, you know, mindfulness in the kitchen and with food, I think even if you don't have a CSA, which I agree with you, I think most of us do have access to more lo- local farmer produced food than we imagine. You just really have to make the effort to go and um, find it. But even if you don't, if you're in the middle of a city and you shop at Whole Foods, I think a way of there, there are ways to enjoy your shopping and enjoy your kitchen more. I think if you're shopping, I loved your idea of just, you know, you are delivered fun produce you've never seen before and have kind of a little impromptu chop, chopped challenge. <laughs> but we, we can all go and seek out kind of those new culinary experiences and try to understand the stories behind that heirloom vegetable or that ingredient from, you know, a different culture or just there's so much that we can learn globally from each other's food mm. that can be really fun 
and part of the experience. And I think enjoying, so that helps you enjoy shopping more and enjoying your kitchen. I think it's important that we enjoy our kitchens mm, and yes. think about ways to do that instead of it be like, oh, I have to go make some more meatloaf. <laughs> <laughs> Buy the French flowers. Have a bowl of fruit you found that's exciting that's, that you're not familiar with and keep it out. Have something fragrant like herbs or sage or eu eucalyptus or, you know, honestly, I just pick evergreen bows and leave them in my arm. Um, leave them in my kitchen this time of year. And I love the fragrance and just the the color and all the things. How can we engage in the details of these necessities in a way that's life-giving and joy-giving and fun? I want to I say two things about that. One is I love one of the little details, little twists in your book. And you call out like every cookbook we buy, you open that cookbook, there's a list at the front of the cookbook that's like, here's all the things you need in your kitchen. And you were like, all right, we all know, we, we know that list. But here's like eight things that I really love. Like they just elevate everything for, for you. Mm -hmm. Which I was like, oh, this is so, it's so fun to read, right? I love, I'm like, what do you have? That's so lovely. <laughs> do, do I have that? Do I feel the same? Do I have something different? So that's like if we're in a place where we're able to go buy the nice pot or the fancy salt or whatever, fabulous, go do it and have fun. And if you're not in a place where that is your reality, and I think that's true for a lot of us, is we're not buying the Le Creuset pot. Mm -hmm. Like, could we lean off the counters so that when you walk in, your kitchen feels Clean. Could you light a candle like the little tea lights yes. you get at the, you know, at Walmart? You know, we grocery right. shop at Walmart sometimes, like, and I buy little candles and they're not super great candles, but you know what? Sometimes it's so lovely to have a bit of candlelight on the counter. Yeah. Or can you listen to music? You like, what can you do to bring a little bit of joy into what might feel laborious or? Yes scary and, yeah. and part of our mindfulness can even be like when i step into the kitchen i feel anxious let me notice that on you know maybe i take a breath maybe i just acknowledge like this makes me anxious i'm trying something new what if i fail and then we step into the kitchen and we try we're we're pulling our meditation practice off the cushion and into the kitchen right i love that mm. so good so I think you have for us, Deborah, a little mindfulness reflection. I do. Practice. Yeah? I do. So tell us, tell us what we're going to experience with you. Well, if you don't mind, I'll just walk you through it. But this is a mindful eating meditation. Um, so you might want to do it uh, when you have access to a little bit of food, but it could be anything. So um, it's it's kind of a gratitude practice, a meditation, and a snack rolled into one. <laughs> mm, I love this. Um, and if you don't mind, I'll just I'll get started and walk us through that. Please. Okay. So <clears throat> grab something small and easy to eat. I have here some homemade granola. Um, maybe nuts, fruit, chocolate, anything convenient. <clears throat> Sit, quiet your soul, and begin taking a few deep breaths. As we know, this can do a lot to calm our nervous system before eating. To the kitchen. To start, take the food in your hand and simply look at the food. Appreciate its shape. Notice how the light falls on it. Consider its natural beauty and the nuances, its uniqueness. When you're ready, take a few minutes to consider, where did this food come from? Sit in gratitude with the story of your food. As I'm sitting here with this granola, I'm considering the sun and the, the soil that nourished these oats, these seeds, these nuts. Um, I'm wondering what it's like in the place where these were grown. 
I'm thinking of some fond memories that I have with the granola that my mom made for us growing up. It's so mind-blowing to consider everything that went in the food that we eat. A bonus outcome for these considerations as we become more conscious consumers. Now, when you're ready, think about the human stories involved in how your food got to you. The farmers passionate about their way of life and the effort they went into growing something nourishing for you. The truck drivers or pilots who transported your food and the journey they went through to bring it to you. The shop clerks at the grocery store who are all real people with their own families and stories and struggle who all had a hand in getting this food to your table. Unless you grow your own food, in which case you could sit in gratitude for your own hard work. Take a moment to sit in gratitude for all of those people. Now spend a moment to smell your food. What do the smells remind you of? Do they provoke any memories for you? Consider how special it is that we have the sense of smell and the way it enriches our evening experience. This is chai spice granola, so it's very fragrant. And I just mm, love considering what those fragrances bring up. Next, place the food in your mouth. Take this as slowly as possible. Try to pay attention to every flavor, the textures in your mouth your body's response to having it in your mouth. It might be salivating and you might start rolling the food around in your mouth. Chew it really thoroughly and savor this experience. Lastly, swallow the food and spend a moment thinking about the journey that food is embarking on through your body and all the millions of cells and organs involved in processing this food to nourish your body, to strengthen you, to keep you alive. Feel the food moving from your mouth to your esophagus, to your stomach. Take time to feel gratitude for your body, for your digestive system, for the daily miracle that life is. All these unconscious processes and hard work that our body does every day without our asking for it. We're often even noticing. Spend a moment appreciating what your body does. And to finish, I spent a few minutes just breathing deeply and feeling gratitude for all that we considered, our food, our bodies, another day with life and breath and the small pleasures we often take her. Lovely. And we could do that with the first bite of everything we eat. That's right. really good. I personally have some trouble digesting when I kind of wolf things down, which I so often do. So learning to eat mindfully not only just way elevates <laughs> that meal and your appreciation for just everything contextually, but I've noticed it does wonders for just my health, my digestion, my um, yeah, my soul's nourishment. <laughs> a lot of a lot of ways that that practice is valuable. I love that. Here is to all of our soul's nourishment as we transition from winter into spring. Deborah, it's been such a pleasure to chat with you. I'm so happy we got to talk all things cooking today. Thank you. Thank you, Meryl. It's been a joy. My pleasure. Listeners, all the links to Deborah's website, to her beautiful cookbook, um, they will be on the show notes along with my CSA. And we'll see you next time. Thanks. Thanks for listening to The Mindful Minute. If you enjoyed today's episode, please consider sharing it with a friend or leaving me a review wherever you get your podcasts. This helps others to find the show. And let's face it, we could definitely use more meditators in this world. The Mindful Minute is recorded on Muskogee land and produced with the support of Brianna Nielsen Virtual Assistance. 
To join my live classes, ask questions, or learn more about my teacher trainings, please visit MerrillArnett.com. Thanks again for listening. I'll see you guys next week.